This week, Wentworth Institute of Technology professor Allison Lang teaches a class about the women's suffrage movement. Professor Lang draws from her book, Picturing Political Power, to describe how women voting rights activists and their opponents used images to support their causes. So we have this scene that's very much kind of in the same world as the previous one. It's suggesting that if women gain rights, if women seek power and win power, they're going to abandon their their domestic duties. They're going to force men to become more womanly. And it's going to lead to other changes, including challenging the class hierarchies, like we see with this domestic servant, as well as the racial hierarchies and the system of slavery. This class was part of a National Endowment for the Humanities Institute for College and University Teachers, hosted by the City University of New York Graduate Center. More in a moment. This episode is brought to you by Progressive. Most of you aren't just listening right now. You're driving, cleaning, and even exercising. But what if you could be saving money by switching to Progressive? Drivers who save by switching save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Multitask right now. Quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Make the most of your me time with sensational hair products from Method. The new range of shampoos and conditioners will leave your hair looking shiny and feeling healthy. From pure peace, infused with peony, rose water, and quinoa protein, to simply nourish, crafted with coconut, rice milk, and shea butter. And daily zen with calming cucumber, seaweed, and green tea. Visit methodproducts.com to unleash your inner shower with Method and reconnect with the best version of yourself. So throughout the seminar, you've been thinking about images during this 19th century period. And specifically today, we're going to think about the ways that images really constructed gender roles, particularly in the 19th century, and the ways that activists use images to shape, alter, um, change uh, gender roles during this time period, too. So what I'd like actually to start off with is just to think about the ways that these images are part of our culture today. And one is the ways that portraits, um, like Susan B. Anthony's portrait, which we see in this 2017 Women's March uh, parade, we see Susan B. Anthony's portrait, she's the closest head to us with the with these circle glasses. Um, and we see this uh, march down Pennsylvania Avenue Um, and this emphasis on this very celebrated 19th century women's rights leader. And we'll talk today about how she became such a famous uh, suffragist, not only in the 19th century, but also today. And I want to also think back to another parade in 1913, um, where we have Inez Milholland down the same street in Washington, DC, Pennsylvania Avenue. And one of the reasons why I'm pointing to this image and how it connects to our current, you know, political and uh, social movement culture is because of this image that was very popular in June of 2020, which is related to the Black Lives Matter movement. It's Brianna Noble riding in a horse um, in Oakland, California. And this image became, was a viral sensation. Perhaps you all saw it. Um, But there's a really interesting similarity between these two women who are riding horses in these urban areas as symbols of of these political causes um, that really, really gives us a sense of how the similarities between these suffrage images that were so famous of Inez Mill Holland from 1913 and images that really still resonate with us today. In fact, this, uh, Brianna actually became a, a spokesperson for Xfinity. So she ended up, you know, this image ended up not only selling, kind of promoting a particular idea, but also selling a particular product. Another recent protest image that you all might remember was this Black Lives Matter being painted outside of Washington, D.C. Um, And you might also know that suffragists were actually the first group to protest right outside the White House to picket the White House in 1917. They're the ones that really made this space around the White House such an important place for political protest. 
And so 100 years later, just over 100 years later, it remains that way today. And if you've ever been to Washington, D.C., you've probably seen someone out the white, outside the White House protesting something. And it's because of these you know, famous protests, these famous images of these famous protests um, that we've gotten to that, uh, where that the place outside of, Was of the White House is so important to our um, political movements. Another image that is probably crossed uh, your, your news media consumption over the past several years are images of women wearing white, particularly leading political figures. Um, this is a group from a State of the Union address, um, all wearing white, and they're wearing white to recall the suffragists in particular. So actually the suffragists were white, um, as we saw with Inez Mill Holland's photograph from the 1913 parade. They wore white at a lot of their parades and processions, and they did it for two reasons. One was to emphasize their morality, their virtue, to suggest that they were kind of pure and, and, and all of the kind of connotations that white might have for us. The other reason they did it is because they wanted to show up in black and white photographs. So in these black and white photographs of people marching in these streets of very various gray toned backgrounds, they knew that women in white would show up better in black and white photographs. And they knew that those black and white photographs, when they were created to half tones and printed in newspapers, they would show up even better. And so even in the 21st century, when we see these women in white, you know, in the in Congress, seated in Congress at the State of the Union, or even in this photograph here, they do tend to stand out. And that is, you know, that is one of the reasons why suffragists chose white to begin with. So in a lot of ways, a lot of the imagery that the suffragists really created throughout the 19th and into the 20th centuries because is still part of our modern political culture. And I'm actually going to go back a little bit further into the 18th century just to start us off and set us up for the visual conversations that are really taking place during the 19th century. So I'd like to start us off with Philip Daw. This is a political cartoon from 1775. It's a mezzo tint. And it's made by Daw, who was a London artist. He probably read about this boycott happening in Edenton, North Carolina, in a local newspaper. As far as we know, he had never been to the colonies. But this is the scene that he imagined after he read about this boycott. It's a group of women in Edenton, North Carolina, who are signing a petition that they aren't going to purchase tea. And you can look closely at this scene. And um, a lot of my images, as you can see, are from the Library of Congress. So if you do a quick search on their website, you can zoom in on them really, really much more closely than you can on, a, um, on, this, on this video. But you can see that there's, this is not a flattering picture. So there's a woman holding a gavel who has this large nose, very unflattering features. There's another woman holding a punch bowl, which we know is not filled with fruit punch. It's filled with alcohol. There's a group pouring out tea canisters in the background. Um, there's the, all the women in the room are abandoned, are, you know, ignoring the child who's under the table. Um, these women are supposed to be caring for that child. And the idea here is that these women are ignoring their essential duties as mothers, as caregivers, in order to participate in this part petition signing. The other detail I really want you to pay attention to is the black woman who's standing behind the woman with the gavel. She's holding a quill um, and an inkwell. And she's not only supporting these women in their participation, she's also looking very eager to sign herself. She looks interested in the process, interested in participating. And so this image is doing at least two things that I want to really point out to us. One is it's challenging the patriarchy. It's challenging the gender hierarchy. It's suggesting that if women participate in politics, it will really turn, it will turn topsy-turvy the gender roles that, um, that colonists are experiencing in American society in the 18th century, right? It'll make women more masculine. It'll mean that women are abandoning their families and ignoring their children. 
The enslaved woman that we see here really also emphasizes that this petition, this scene is challenging the racial heart hierarchy. It's challenging white supremacy. It's challenging the dominance of slavery, which is an, a really central uh, economic driver in the British colonies during the late 18th century. So the, the idea here is to laugh at these women, to mock them, to not take them seriously. And it's also expressing anxieties about whether this rebellion that is starting in the colonies might not just challenge the British government, the British Empire as they know it, but might also be part of this challenge of gender and racial hierarchies. And this, this kind of representation actually doesn't change much. So I want us to, to see kind of the, the similarities of this conversation over time. So as you know, by the 1840s, women's rights activists are petitioning on a much broader scale, not only for the right to vote, but also for property rights to have better access to education, to be participants and leaders within the church. So a range of issues. And by 1850, we have the very first National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester, Massachusetts. And this is happening, this print is completed in 1851. So just a year after that. So by that time, Americans throughout the country are very aware of this rising, growing women's rights movement and its vibrance and its increasing power in the United States. And yet the images are changing very little. This is about 75 years after that previous image. We see a woman in the center who is Mrs. Turkey. She's smoking. She's wearing bloomers. She's showing us her ankle which may not seem very scandalous to us in the 21st century, but would have been remarkable in 1851. She has her hand fairly condescendingly placed on, her, on this man's head who's hunched over, kind of looking like an older woman, mending clothes, doing these menial tasks. Both of them are ignoring the child who is crying in the front of the room. You know, his banner says, no more papa and mama. In the background, we have these two women, both holding banners as well, also wearing bloomers. One says no more basement and kitchen. And I think she's intending to represent a servant, a working class woman. And the other one is a black woman who's smoking a pipe and she has a sign protesting slavery. So we have this scene that's very much kind of in the same world as the previous one. It's suggesting that if women gain rights, if women seek power and win power, they're going to abandon their, their domestic duties. They're gonna force men to become more womanly. And it's going to lead to other changes, including challenging the class hierarchies, like we see with this domestic servant, as well as the racial hierarchies and the system of slavery. All of these things are wrapped up in this 1851 print. And this is the kind of, this is the moment when there are a lot of these prints in, in, in the incredibly broad scale, right? We know that this is the moment where the where illustrated newspapers are on the rise. Um, these engravings are ever more popular. And so I just want to give you a sense of the, the breadth of these by showing you this other one from 1851 from Harper's New Monthly Magazine. Very similar tropes. We have a woman smoking a cigar, women wearing men's clothing, um, women such as the top hat, women wearing bloomers. And I should note that these bloomer skirts are very short. In, in reality, a lot of women who wore bloomers, the skirts were down to their ankles. We have another woman um, off to the right side pulling up her bloomer uh, pants, kind of showing us her ankle again. Um, and we also in this image have a two women with their backs toward us who are actually linking arms, giving us a suggestion that these women are so reliant on each other and so interested in only promoting the interests perhaps of other women that they're romantically interested in other women as well and, and can kind of fully abandon men um, in this version of their reality. And so I want to kind of connect this to some of the Civil War imagery that you've probably been talking about in many of your other conversations, because by the time we get to the, the Civil War era, the mid 19th century, this, this association between women's dress with weakness, with um, frivolity, with 
um, kind of with the kind of person you don't take very seriously politically or otherwise becomes part of a meme related to the capture of Jefferson Davis after the Civil War because he is caught wearing women's clothing and this becomes an incredibly popular uh, image to reproduce in a variety of ways. So for example, here are some carte de visite versions of this image. And if you do some quick searching, you can find many, many more examples of this. And this joke really only works if you can, if you think of men in women's clothing as, as women's clothing as being this kind of um, signifier that you are less than, that you are weaker, that you are um, uh, worth mocking, that it's laughable, right? So it's the signifier that he is no longer a powerful person when we see him in these, in women's clothing like this. So this is, this is the, um, this is the ways that, you know, even women's rights imagery, when we see them wearing bloomers, this is suggesting that they're wearing masculine clothing, that they are slightly more powerful. Um, this is the way that these clothing act as signifiers of their power and their gender roles during this time period. This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening to me talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average. And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Come celebrate 10 years in the ultimate open world of Tamriel and play The Elder Scrolls Online for free, now until April 9th. Adventure solo or alongside friends on unforgettable quests slaying dragons, defending castles, and traversing wintry Skyrim or the mushroom forests of Morrowind. With no catch-up grind or subscription required and fun content no matter how long you have to play, start your legend today for free. Head to elderscrollsonline.com slash freeplay, rated M for Mature. So I want to jump, this is right around the same time period as the last couple images we looked at, 1869. So just after the Civil War. And as you all know, in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, people are considering what to do next. Um, by 1869, Americans are debating the 15th Amendment. It's about to be ratified. 15th Amendment, of course, prohibits voter discrimination based on race and effectively enfranchises Black men. And so in this moment, people are also wondering, should women get the vote too? And so this image by Courier and Eyes, this lithograph, actually suggests that uh, what will happen if women win the vote. And it looks to all of us very similar to what we've been seeing, right? We see women in slightly more traditional clothing, uh, but they are wearing kind of frivolous, outlandish versions of that clothing. Their hair is far larger than their, is poofed up far larger than their heads. There are extravagant bows. Um, it's really to emphasize that they are kind of too interested in fashions and not practical enough to be um, proper, uh, uh, you know, voters. One of the kind of favorite details of the scene is the vote for the celebrated man tamer, Susan Sharptongue. Um, what I, I think this phrase is it really explicitly says a lot about what they think about women in politics at the time. And in fact, refers to a lot about what people say in politics, even about women in politics, even in the 21st century. The other detail about this scene that I want to make sure we point out is this man carrying a baby, which is a very popular uh, a, a trope that's repeated over and over again in these women's anti-women's rights images. Um, and we see this woman telling him that he needs to take care of the baby and this man just absolutely appalled that he's going to have to take care of this task. So these anti-women's rights images 
as you can see, this is a century after the very first historical image that I showed you. They remain fairly consistent over time, and they really do through the end of the um, suffrage movement in the night with, in 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, and in fact, a lot of these anti-women's rights images, these themes still are part of our anti-feminist imagery um, of the 21st century too. And so you can see why suffragists like Sojourner Truth and Elizabeth Cady Stanton worked very hard to challenge these ideas. And so one of the things that you can probably already tell about these anti-women's rights images is that they're not coordinated, right? They are not, um, these publishers, these editors, these artists, they aren't in a group together all deciding to uh, coordinate attack against the women's rights movement. This is simply um, a, a more disorganized, loose uh, affiliation where every you know publisher knows that majority of their readers are against women's voting rights. So if they publish these images in their illustrated newspaper, most of their readers will support them. And so what we have, one change we have in the 1860s, as you know, is that cartes of visite become so very popular. And Suffragists have no very little control over mainstream news consumption, news publications. But carte de visites, they can control. They can take these photographs. They can sell them to at least their supporters and perhaps even a broader public through a studio. And Sojourner Truth is really the first activist to do this very effectively in a very coordinated way. This is one of her many photographs. She, a lot of her photographs, she looks very similar. So this is a very thoughtfully um, posed portrait. Um, and this also says at the bottom, I sell the shadow to support the substance. And as you all know, photographs were made using sunlight during this time period. So a shadow is a very common term for a photograph. And she's selling this shadow to support the substance, which is not only herself, because she is a professional reformer and um, she lives off of the money she makes as a reformer, but also her substantial reforms. So she puts money into supporting herself, but also the causes that she works toward. So she's an anti-slavery and women's rights activist um, who by the 1860s is a very popular lecturer, kind of very famous in reformer circles. And she decides to sit for this portrait to prove a couple of things about herself. One is that she wants to portray herself as a very respectful, respectable, uh, fairly refined, motherly, feminine figure. And so we can see that all of the details, the props in this scene are part of that image, right? We have this kind of suggestion of domesticity with the arrangement of flowers on the table, with the book on the table and the tablecloth, as well as the suggestion of, of kind of womanly activities um, with the knitting. She's also emphasizing that she is a very um, uh, matronly, respectable woman with her clothes. They're not overly frivolous or fashionable. They're fairly simple. Um, and they really emphasize that she is a working woman, especially because of her head wrap. In contrast, we have Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, who are far less interested or concerned with appearing domestic or motherly. In fact, the expressions on their faces are very different. They look more aggressive, defiant. Um, they have a little bit less to prove than Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth is not only challenging the anti-women's rights cartoons that we are looking at, she's also challenging the racist, racist stereotypes that are so popular at the time as well. So Elizabeth K. Stanton and Susan B. Anthony see the success of distributing a portrait like Sojourner Truths. They see the interest in them, the ways that it can challenge these dominant ideas about women's rights leaders. And they decide to do their own portrait in 1870. You can see that they are more interested in showing a little bit more about their fashions. They've got these lacy out um, kind of uh, um, shawl in this lacy color, and you can see more jewelry with them. So they're clearly wealthier than Sojourner Truth is. But they are really emphasizing that they are leaders of a movement, that you better not cross them, um, and that they are um, going to be pushing forward together. And this doesn't change anti-women's rights cartoons too much, but it does in one really significant way. 
And that is the previous illustrations we were looking at often really emphasize nameless, generic women. But once women's individual portraits, like Susan B. Anthony's, become more familiar, the cartoonists actually specify which suffragists that they are making fun of. And you can see that Thomas West here basically exactly copied this 1870 portrait in this illustration. And it's very similar to the other, um, other cartoons that we were looking at earlier. We have Susan B. Anthony wearing very masculine looking clothing. Her skirt is too short. She's got boots on and the boots even have spurs on them. Um, in the background, we have a women's political rally. And this is from 1873. So women were not yet having these kinds of political protests and rallies yet. We also have a woman who's a police officer and two men who are doing domestic tasks, including holding a baby and grocery shopping. So very similar to the other images that we were looking at, but slightly updated in that we can tell immediately that it's Susan B. Anthony. And the artist was so intent on emphasizing kind of like particularly taking Anthony down, um, that the artist actually replicated the eye issue that she had. So if you look closely here, um, you can see that one of her eyes is slightly out of focus. Um, and this was one of the reasons why she often posed in profile, why we often maybe think of her image in profile, but the artist perhaps knew this and decided to replicate that in this front page illustration for the Daily Graphic. Suffragists still wanted to appear like these kinds of political figures, like these presidential candidates uh, that, that we are images that we're so familiar with today. I'm sure you can think of many versions of this image uh, of these male political leaders um, in many institutions that you've been in. And so they decided to create one of their first major visual, visual representation projects through the history of women suffrage. And that was first published in 1881, and it eventually became a set of six volumes that were about a thousand pages each um, that were published from 1881 through 1922. So these are two images from the very first volume. It was edited by Anthony Stanton and Matilda Jocelyn Gage. And they told a very particular story of the women's suffrage movement. They wanted to emphasize first that women were leaders. And so when they were creating these portraits, they really made sure that they resembled the portraits that we were just looking at here. They also decided that they wanted to emphasize that, uh, that they, didn't, they did not want to include any portraits of men, despite the fact that men were really important to the women's voting rights movement. They were um, important political leaders and officials and voters um, and played a really significant role in, for example, publication of their newspapers and leadership of their organizations. But this book really skews that image and really only emphasizes female leadership. They also only included portraits of white women in this text. So even though they had, knew Sojourner or Truth, worked with her you know, on and off regularly, um, and, and many others like Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, they did include any portraits of them. They also decided to really minimize the importance of the competing organization. So Stan and Anthony had their own organization and there was another organization called the American Women's Suffrage Association that received very little attention in this book. And so they really skewed the version of the history that um, became the dominant history of the movement and in fact still really affects our interpretation of the movement today because we often think about Stanton and Anthony as the main leaders of the movement and often the women of color um, the fact that Lucy Stone and her Boston organization was dramatically larger than theirs that a far more successful newspaper all of them often get lost in favor of this written narrative that they created. And this is just to remind you that these anti-women's rights cartoons are still the most popular images uh, in you know, American visual culture in the late 19th century. This is a, a stereograph from 1899, very much again, suggesting that if women participate in politics, they're going to you know, be interested in reading newspapers and paying attention to things other than the laundry, uh, which is what this man in the background is doing. So by the late 19th century and early 20th century, suffragists decided to change tactics. So they had promoted portraits of their leaders, especially in the late 19th century, 
But around the turn of the century, they decided they really needed a more effective visual campaign. And they needed to respond directly to these political cartoons that suggested that if women win political rights, that they will become manly, right? So this is why imagery like this becomes really the dominant kind of imagery produced by suffragists. This is imagery that really emphasizes that white women need the vote in order to be better mothers. The other thing I want to really emphasize here is that the suffrage movement gives a lot of women, as particularly female professional artists, opportunities. And that includes Blanche Ames, who created this image. It was published in the Women's Journal as well as the Boston Transcript. And it's called Double the Power of the Home, Two Good Votes Are Better Than One. And I don't want us to pay attention to that word, that phrase, two good votes. So this is an emphasis on who Blanche Ames and many other suffragists like her think of as a good voter, right? So we see this white mother with her children, three children around her in this ideal home. It has a God bless our home sign in the back, a tea kettle on the stove steaming away. And this is the kind of good voter that Blanche Ames and so many others envision. And, and so people who maybe can't have one parent stay at home with their children, so people who, are, who don't have as much money as this woman, or people of color, or you know, an immigrant perhaps, um, these people are not kind of included in this propaganda representation of why women need the vote. And this, as I said, is a very popular kind of uh, component of the suffrage campaign. This image is by Rose O'Neill, who was another famous uh, professional female artist of the time. She, um, you might remember, you know, be familiar with the design. Uh, she also designed the Cupid doll. And it says, give mother the vote, we need it. Uh, Votes for our mothers is kind of part of uh, protecting their food, their health, their play, their homes, their schools, et cetera. So these are all the reasons why suffragists and many others are arguing that women need the vote. And there's also an emphasis in response to those political cartoons that women who are suffragists are also fashionable and very feminine. So this is kind of the before and after image by Boardman Robinson from 1911 showing what suffragists used to look like in popular culture. You know, this very frumpy woman with glasses and her skirts a little too short and with this long kind of frumpy jacket shifting to this kind of more idealized elite fashionable type um, with this extravagant feathered hat who looks very similar to this representation of this ideal white female type, the Gibson girl from this era. And you can imagine why um, women of color like Mary Church Terrell are trying to be included in this imagery, right? So women's suffrage imagery that's created by these mainstream white organizations who are led by white women really focuses on promoting the vote for white women in particular. And none of their imagery emphasizes that they're also fighting for the vote for women of color. Mary Church Terrell was born enslaved, but she became one of the first women in the United States to earn both a, a first, first black woman in the United States to earn both a bachelor's and master's degree. She actually was also elected to be the first president of the National Association of Colored Women, which was founded in 1896. And this organization was different from other suffrage organizations. They supported the vote, they wanted the vote for women, but they were also thinking more broadly about gender and race-based issues. So they were thinking about um, protecting the vote for black men who were losing it on a broad scale in the South by the 1890s. They were thinking about anti-segregation, anti-lynching. They were thinking about how to educate their children better. So it was a much more broad movement and Mary Church Terrell, as you can see from this image and many others of her like it, she really emphasizes that she and her fellow Black women's rights activists are extraordinarily respectable, refined, elegant. Um, she was very interested in fashion. Um, and you can see this, she often has um, extravagant hats on herself in these images. She was a very, a fairly wealthy woman, a very, fairly elite woman in Washington, DC at the time. And you can see the similarities between her and this image from one of her speeches 
and this representation of an idealized so-called new Negro woman from 1904, right? So, and it's not that dissimilar in, in silhouette, in hairstyle, in uh, dress from the Gibson girl ideal that we were looking at just a moment ago. Sephora stores are everywhere you are. So just pop in when you need a brown lip to match your 90s playlist. A confidence boost before your interview? Or a last-minute gift for mom's birthday? There's always a Sephora near you. Just pop in. Use our store locator to find your local Sephora or Sephora at Kohl's. The most exciting part of a vacation stay at a home rental? Easy. It's being greeted upon arrival with a rusted lockbox affixed to the underside of a stranger's condo. Yeah, you simply twist knobs, click gears, jiggle it, and then rip it off its moorings, and voila! Your prize is a key to a questionable home rental and maybe tetanus. When you just want to get your vacation started by actually getting into your room, it matters where you stay. At Hilton, we deliver your key right to your phone on the Hilton Honors app. Hilton for the stay. And I want to kind of also mention this image because unlike all the images I've shown you so far, this one is really unusual. So all the you know, anti-women's rights cartoons, you could find many others like it. Um, but this is the only one that I found in my research that emphasized that Black women needed the vote in order to be good mothers, in order to protect their families. So this is from the 1910s. Um, this is the South Battalion of Death, what votes for women means to the South. And unfortunately, the National Association of Colored Women did not have the funds or resources or, um, you know, people power to create the same kind of propaganda that the white women's organizations did, despite the fact that Terrell actually advocated for um, a, a portion of the organization and budget to be um, spent on visual campaigning. But the NAACP actually created this for the crisis. And so this is kind of one of the few pro-women's voting rights uh, propaganda pieces we have that really emphasizes uh, Black women need this political power. This woman is holding a bat labeled Federal Constitution, and she's beating down segregation, Jim Crow laws, and grandfather clauses in order to protect the women in her skirts. And so this is really emphasizing that not only white women need the vote, but black women do too. And for a very similar reason, which is to protect their families. So I want to hop into photographs, which is a very different genre shift from the images that we've been looking at previously. And it corresponds with a very different tactical shift within the movement itself as well. This is the moment in the early 1910s, really starting in 1907. Um, but by the 1910s, we have a lot of suffrage activists who are work, walking in parades like this one. This is the 1913 parade that we looked at at the very beginning of our conversation with Inez Milholland on her horse um, in 1913. This is the same parade. And so this is a, a, a very different world of protesting, right? And it's very different from the images of women as mothers that we've been looking at, too. And so this image really emphasizes that women are um, kind of taking the streets and they are also very conscious of taking advantage of the fact that halftones are becoming more popular in news publications. They're also in this particular case, taking advantage of the fact that the next day was going to be Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. So they're aware that there's going to be a lot of press in Washington DC. They're, they're aware that there would be a lot of photojournalists in Washington, D.C., and so they take advantage of that with this parade. And they kind of have this idealized, kind of very costumed, spectacular representation. And the next image that I'm going to show you kind of uh, adds a better sense of why someone like Mary Church Terrell was working so hard on her public image. And I just kind of want to prepare you for this racist stereotype here. This is from Puck from 1913, and it's making fun of the women who are participating in the 1913 parade. The white women who were organizing it did not want to have black and white women march together. So originally they were open to it, but then a, a contingent of suffragists protested against it. And that's what we see here. We see this white woman who is appalled that these black women want to march with her to also ask for the vote. 
And we can see that this cartoon is doing two, two things. It's making fun of the suffragists who don't want them to participate, but it's also a racist stereotype of these black women who want to march in the parade as well. Um, it's emphasizing facial, facial features. They don't have idealized body types. Their fashions are not current. Um, and so we can see that this is kind of doing both things and we can understand why someone like Mary Church Terrell, who wants to emphasize that black women are these respectable, refined, elegant leaders, um, is doing the work that she's doing. And so when we're thinking about these um, political protests. I mean, ultimately, then the 1913 parade, Ida B. Wells marches in that parade, Mary Church Terrell marches in that parade, and she actually is able to get a contingent of Delta Sigma Theta um, college students from Howard University to march in that parade, too. It was far more integrated than that cartoon suggests. Um, but we should also remember that um, these Black women who mar were marching in the parade were far more threatened as well. They were um, more susceptible to violence. Um, they were more um, uh, susceptible even to critique from their fellow marchers. Mary Church Terrell also participated um, in the pickets in Washington, D.C. that I mentioned at the very beginning. These are, as I said, the very first pickets at the White House, and they started putting these pickets together in January of 1917, which, as you might know, is the same year, the same month that the United States is entering World War I. So there's a lot of controversy over whether they should be doing this at the time. And I would argue that we need both these pickets and the publicity they attract, these photographs that are published across the United States. As you all know, um, they were ultimately arrested, sent to workhouses, or um, went on hunger strikes and were force fed. And all of that garnered significant publicity, not to mention the fact that, you know, pr the president drove by them every day in and out of the White House, could see them from his windows him and many other politicians were having to kind of deal with the consequences of this protest. And yet, one of the really powerful images that the suffragists really uh, made a compelling case for is this idea that women were participating in the war effort, were patriotic citizens, were motherly caregivers, like the poster we see here. You can see that this is a direct kind of continuation of that suffrage imagery we were looking at a moment ago says the greatest mother in the world. This greatest mother in the world is the mother who is a, a citizen, who is willing to extend her caregiving expertise in support of her country, um, not just as a voter, as the suffrage propaganda emphasized, but as a nurse in this particular case. So I want to emphasize that although this isn't technically a suffrage poster, this is an image that's very much building off the rhetoric, the imagery of those suffrage um, of campaigns from earlier that we discussed. One of these, so in, it, you know, in comparison to the protesters that we were just looking at, the picketers, there were a lot more suffragists who decided to enlist as nurses, who decided to become farmers, who decided to work in factories in order to support the war effort. And ultimately, their existence really became the reason why a lot of political officials, including Woodrow Wilson himself, they used these women as examples for why they were supporting women's voting rights. They said that women were, you know, participate, you know, being patriotic citizens, part demonstrating their support for the nation in these various ways, rarely acknowledge the importance of these uh, picketers at the White House. But I think we can agree that it was really the combination of these two kinds of um, popular images, um, whether controversial, which kept them in the news, kept them on people's minds, and this more moderate and even conservative representation that, um, gave more conservative politicians and officials, more moderate politicians and officials too, kind of an argument, a case for why they are making this decision. And ultimately, a lot of, a lot of women did not gain the right to vote with the passage of the 19th Amendment, and it re is reflected very much by the imagery that we've been looking at, right? So the 19th Amendment declares that it prohibits voter uh, discrimination based on gender, based on sex, and so this basically means that any state laws that 
put into place grandfather clauses, poll taxes, literacy tests, anything that prohibits, um, you know, Native American women don't even have citizenship right, um, citizenship rights on the whole. Asian American women don't win them until the 1940s. So this 19th Amendment really most effectively enfranchises white women. And we can see that a lot of the propaganda is reflective of that too. We can see that a lot of suffrage organizations were specifically fighting for the vote for white women as well. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. Be sure to check out our Q&A podcast. This week our guest is Peter Canellos, Politico editor-at-large and the author of The Great Dissenter. He talks about the life, career, and legacy of Supreme Court Justice John Marshall Harlan of Kentucky. And check out C-SPAN's new app called C-SPAN Now. Watch live or on-demand C-SPAN's complete coverage of the U.S. House and Senate, congressional hearings, White House events, the courts, campaigns, and more from the world of politics. Find it in the Apple App Store or on Google Play.